we are honored today to be able to be here with Clement Jimerson. He is one of the participants in the Alexi Wade in uh, the Alexi Wade in 1960, and also very much a part of the work of that time and and since then to to both continue to 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 do the important work of, of bringing about the changes in the community, but also specifically to to really help keep the story of the heroes of the civil rights work um, in front of the community. So we are pleased to have Simon here with us today. And um, and I'm just gonna get him started by asking a few questions. So to get started here and, and then we will enjoy um, learning from Clement here today. And, and I I should say it's just a just a great honor to be able to have worked with Clement and to consider him a close friend and an ally in this important work to help people understand the importance of this history for the Gulf Coast. Um, so Clement, you um certainly have a wonderful memory of the what was going on in your life and in the community at this time. And also, you know, why it was that this was so important. Um, I think many people listening probably may know a little bit about the important story of the Biloxi Wade Ends and know a little bit about the leadership of, of, uh, of Dr. Gilbert R. Mason, who came here at a position. But if you could, I guess a good place to start, Clement, is sort of where you were, kind of how old you were, your relationship with with Dr. Mason and, and why it was that that you then, you know, to kind of put your life on the line to, to go out and be part of this important effort. Yes, Dave, it's so glad to see you this morning <laughs> and this evening. Uh, basically, uh, Yes, I guess I started first of all saying that the order of the day was uh, a different trend from what it is today. And, uh, you know, to be living on the Division Street between Elm and Main Street. And uh, when you got ready to walk down the sidewalk, uh, you could just walk down if another occasion a white individual was walking down. That you had to end up, uh, you know, getting off the sidewalk. You really couldn't even look at him. Uh, and my uncle told me at an early age that uh, always addressed him by yes, sir, or no, sir. And uh, I took his uh, message to heart. Uh, of course, then yeah, you have the city buses that's running right in front of your house. And when you get ready to get on it, you couldn't necessarily get. Go and get it, get put your money in the, the cash register and just walk in and take your seat. You had to come off the front door and go to the back door and then, yeah. you know, egress into a bus. And then you couldn't just kind of walk back through the bus. No, you back. couldn't walk back because of the color of your skin. Wow. We were black and uh, so we could sit. Back in that little back section, which wasn't very many seats at all. And then, if the bus, for some reason, another got filled up with uh, Cajun or the whites, then, then it started overflowing, and we would have, you would have to get up and give them your seat and stand up. So I just didn't feel comfortable with that. I don't think it was right. I don't know how yeah. you feel about it. But anyway, uh, that was the order of the day when you went downtown that you saw the little, you know, on a real summer hot day, you see these water fountains and they had white only on there, but then they had color. So you can just go and drink at a water fountain. So that kind of, you know, that kind of, I guess, kind of worried me that my mm-hmm. things were like that, but anyway, and then, so and so from the time you were born, the beach was you know sort of restricted for the black families, right? 
Well, from the time I was born, because yeah. I was born in 1945, yeah. on Keystone Field. Yeah. But my mother told me, but when she was born, the beach was not like it, like it is now. And it was just like a, like a little pad that they walked on, and the water was right there. But they could assess the beach, you know, and that was that. But of course, you know, we have hurricanes here, and because of the hurricanes, it causes the damage. And so we had this real severe hurricane back in, uh, I think, the 40s. And uh, that's when the Army, the federal government, Thompson, Manny Kenny, and all the Corps of Engineers started to go on, come in and Get the beach like it is now. Put in the seawall and then the first, right? They did the seawall first, right? And then, of course, after the seawall, then they started pumping in the white sand that you see out there. So that full lane highway and the seawall and the white sand went out there before it was just like that. Yeah. That was part of it. So, and, uh, so, of course, what I guess the money was generated, of course, the, the government funds came from the taxpayers. And uh, it was stated that, uh, you know, the property owner that had that all these elemental homes, these mansions on the beach, that all the way to the water's edge across the, the highway at, at my time. Yeah. And they were, they considered it. They considered that their property, their personal property, but it wasn't. And so they would then so, sort of like chase people out because they would say you're trespassing or that's their property or people didn't even worry about it? No, they wouldn't necessarily chase you off, but if you were caught out there, then the police would stop and okay. you know, arrest you or harass you yep. or tell you to get off the beach. Yep. Which you no, know, I never did venture down there to experiment that. But uh, but then uh, of course we had uh, several doctors. Uh, first doctor we had in Biloxi was was a black was a doctor Kyle, and he lived across from the where the Paradise Garden is and the building that's there now is behind the his building. But uh, Paradise Garden was a was a larger structure than what you see there now. And right across the street was where Dr. Kyle practiced his uh, medicine. A few years later, a uh, lady came in that was a doctor, and she stayed here temporarily, not, not a real long time. And of course, after that, then I guess between her and Dr. Kyle, they was able to get Dr. Mason to come in after he had finished. Uh, he had gone to Howard University and then from that to Meharry to do his residency. And of course, while he was in those areas, he would always venture to the beach. Of course, he originally from Jackson, Mississippi, and he also was on the swimming team mm -hmm. when he was in high school. So he had a love for, for the water. And uh, of course, I had a love for the water too. And it was being denied for me to go there. So, so how old were you when Dr. Mason started his practice, you know? I guess I might have been around about maybe 10 or okay. 11 years old. Okay. Yeah. And then he pretty quickly became a scoutmaster there. That's part of the Yeah, of the that was one of the things that was auxiliary that he uh, mm -hmm. took hold of uh, becoming a scoutmaster. He actually was, uh, I think, one of the committee persons that first we had another gentleman that was stationed on the base, and we used to call him uh, Bowley. They were right down, right, right below where Main Street was. He was a original cop master, and uh, Dr. Mason was the assistant. And of course, I guess later on, Dr. Mason you know, was elevated to scout master. And uh, so, my connection with him as a general practitioner, you know, for our family was very strong and then of course he I, I kind of adopted him. I knew who my dad is, I knew my daddy's name on my birth certificate, but I had never 
see him yet, of course. And with the family itself, nobody really do anything. But uh, now that I'm talking to you, uh, I've since have uh, the divorce decree that was given to me by my mother once I related to my nephew my father. And uh, actually, they got a divorce when I was about two years old. See, okay. And uh, so, but anyway, I didn't have a you know, the father figure. And I kind of gravitated to Dr. Mason, and then he kind of took me in as, a, as a son. And that's why he, when you saw Gilbert Jr., he called me big brother. So we had that we yeah. had that connection. Yeah. yeah. So, so so on the so I guess with the nineteen sixty waiting, you would have been how old then? I was fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. Yeah. And if you, you know, that, that, that's that's when you were out on the beach. Can you talk a bit about that for us? You kind of help us see it from your memory, what that was like? Yes. Uh, I was 14, and uh, he, uh, my daughter was, my, my sister was uh, four years, my half-sister was four years older than me. Maybe Gloria Jean uh, Lee. Later on, she got married and she was in Davis. But anyway, uh, she was four grades ahead of me. We uh, always wanted to go on the beach, but we were denied. And then, uh, of course, you had uh, most of the businesses that live right across the street from us. We had Lambert's grocery store, which was white off, and uh, Joe. The Darius grocery store on the corner right there where Nance Temple is, mm -hmm. which was uh, right on across the street where the most of the family hill is on that corner. We had a grocery store that was owned by Joanne's, Joanne's grocery store by Blacks. Okay. So then right next to Lambert's grocery was a Jay's Fabric store, which was right on. So you had the white businesses that was, mm -hmm. you know, you uh, was making money and serving and giving the commodities or uh, whatever to the, to the people. But when you went in there, you couldn't interact with the whites. You just go and pay your money and just come out, you know. Okay. So even though all, almost all the customers are right there in the neighborhood. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's what the customer was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, even you. Give you a picture. Yeah, yeah. But we had like had those little grocery stores right there and then of course up there on the corner of uh, Nichols Drive, which was Belma at the time. They had another grocery store called it was Miles, it was mm -hmm. White On. Mm -hmm. And then uh on the corner of Nixon and the one called Trayon, Trey Uh and on the corner of the Mute Street at the Vision Street for the Bob Grocery, which was like, yeah, yeah, a lot of grocery stores right there near you. That's interesting. <laughs> Didn't have fun to go. Yeah, yeah. And I used to hate it out of passion because they would ask my sister to go. And they always had me running. Uh -huh. go, go get this. Go get this. So, of course, when it came time to eat, I was happy. <laughs> so, but. Uh, and I think you can try to get to actually the way it is yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess after all those different years of Dr. Mason uh, being the scoutmaster, we had uh, have our, we used to have our meetings at the Saint it was a breakfast Saint John AME Church, which was right where the park is now. And I, you know, it's moved out. Right. We're down there. Like that other church down there and became Greater St. John. But we would have our meetings down in the bottom part of that church. And then sometimes we would go over to Bird Baptist, you know. Bishop Black, my classmate, he was a true 419, which was connected with St. Paul United Methodist Church. I was in 416, which was, uh, you know, Dr. Mason's troop. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, 
you uh, would go over to, we used to hike over to shoot up a blood up. I don't know if you know what that is. It's over in Diabaville. Mm -hmm. And uh, all that was segregated, that area there. So when you and that bridge that, that went across was just a two line bridge. And that little uh, drawbridge was one of those kind that opened up like this. Okay. And uh, so what, what happened is when we would leave Biloxi, and if my family was driving through Diabaville, when they got on that two lane bridge, they, they would just push the gravel rates, push the pedal down very hard so we can get there. <laughs> okay. Because the color was key. Okay. Know. But uh, but anyway, we uh, took a, had a little cap out, a cap out and had to shoot a couple of them. So, I mean, we hiked from Biloxi over in all the bags and yeah. everything. Okay. And we're going to do the rough it out, you know. So, we hiked over there and went around there to shoot a couple of them. You went down to shoot a couple of them and you got in that section, back in the section. I don't know if you've been back there, but it's clay. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. And to see the water, the water is fresh because it's, mm -hmm. it's fresh water and you can swim in it. Okay. Okay. You get your, your eyes wasn't burning. Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, we camped there overnight. We pitched our tents and put them back in the tree. Mm -hmm. Take cooking bits. Okay. So we're not maintaining the roof in the, in the wild, you know. Mm -hmm. So, we got ready to go back the next day, then all the other scouts that I really got their stuff and packed up and had no cross. So we went walk and everybody gonna pick you up. So I was I was kind of behind everybody. So I had my stuff for and it was super hot out there. I said, she really it's really hot out there today. Start sweat was coming down. And one time I said, I wonder if I'm a baby. And before I knew anything, this car pulled up. And there was a white couple in there. And they say, Are you all right? Can we give you a ride? And I thought about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they gave me a ride and came on across the bridge, and then they let me off. Further back so that my fellow scholars could see I caught a ride. They okay. like, I can do <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, I'm just giving you some of the experiences yeah, yeah. with Dr. Mason with the scout path. Of course, we went up to Camp Adewar. Mm -hmm. I think you know they have Camp T.I. Mm -hmm. Camp T.I. was the white. Okay. Uh, okay. Camp. And we we'll actually go to that, but we had Camp Adewar. And uh, that's what we went up and did, like the canoe and, and okay. swimming in the some swimming. And, 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 and did you know that Dr. Mason was already, you know, kind of kind of working on some of these issues as far as the beach and everything when you were a scout? Or uh, when, when did you kind of know that this was something that he was? I didn't. On? I didn't really know it because I was. I basically was in the, you know, just a child uh -huh. enjoying. Uh, in the scouting, okay. going to school, and uh, didn't know he had the activity going in the back. We had formed all his committees mm -hmm. and actually brought different groups together and started having these different meetings. Uh, I didn't know that uh, when he actually went down there, decided with his neighbors to go down there in 1959 on May the 14th. Yeah. Uh, to go and test it. Uh, I didn't know that it happened. Okay. To, okay. Uh, and did people know on. kind of afterwards? Was it kind of talked about afterwards or was, was it pretty quiet? Well, it probably was talked about by the adults. Yeah. The yeah. ones that were connected with him. Yep. Because when he went down there with, uh, with Kevin Jr., I think Kevin Jr. was about five years old, 59, when he went down there, his neighbors. And when he was out there on the beach, just so of course it definitely they was right there by the the section just before the lighthouse it was in that section and that's where they had like the, the Biloxi hotel was up there and they had a 
the, the medium in that is a lot wider than it is on the other part of the strip of the beach. And just so happened when they was out there, this one lady had an accident and a car was in the medium and the police came. That's what drew the police there. I see. And when the police came, then um, he looked over and saw them on the beach and uh, he actually went down as he finished with his taking care of the person and he went down and told them that they didn't have no right to be on the beach. And of course, Dr. Mason has saw the, the barrel that's on the beach that's provided by the, the county, the Harrison County Board of Supervisors, and he questioned him as to why, what, 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 what law is forbidding him from being on the beach? And the officer said he, he didn't know, he couldn't answer. Because he was telling me like the, the, the barrels on the beach that's paying by the half the county and the citizens are paying the taxes on the beach. You know, Dr. Mason, highly intelligent. And the uh, officer, well, he didn't know nothing about that. He said, but I tell you what, if you follow me down to the police station, you can ask that to the captain. He made the answer. And so Dr. Mason, I think, and the other uh, neighbor that uh, went down I guess the rest of them probably would go home. But anyway, from that, when he got that in favor to the captain of the police, he had the station at that time, then he told him, uh, you better not go down there no more. If you do, you're going to be sorry. Yeah. And of course, that invades Dr. Mason. Yeah. He probably didn't say anything to him. But anyway, uh, so I really didn't. And I think that's when he had started getting his little uh, committees together and you know, going to the different auxiliaries. Um, him in, in connected with Dr. Dawn over in Gunford, who was another family physician, a general, general practitioner. Um, and then, um, so you were asking how, how did I become conscious? Right. right. So I really didn't come, become conscious until he actually decided to go down there on the, the 17th. Um, and, uh, that, was, that was the next year, 1960. In April, yeah. in 1960. Yeah, yeah I should have said that. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but he decided to go down there. And what he did, when he extended the invitation to his member of that first missionary Baptist church, mm -hmm. to go down there with him. And they all said they was gonna be going down there with him. So what he did was told him that uh, uh, that when he got that on that particular Sunday when he was in church, he got up and made an announcement that you know he was going to be going to meet down on the beach, down by the lighthouse at uh, uh, I think two o'clock, and you know everybody said they were going to be down there with him. But anyway, he ended up going down there by his, he, he, he went down there and when he got down there, nobody else showed up. Yeah. And so when nobody showed up, I don't know what drew the police there, but anyway, the police came and saw him out there and the police arrested him. But he was so organized and prepared that he already had given uh, Natalie, his wife, and bail bond by that to come and bail him out they arrested him. But the police arrested him, and when they arrested him, the word got into the community. So that's the first time I heard about, yeah, yeah. about him being uh, on the beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when they arrested him, the word, then that's when they started having the community rallies in the concerned citizen meeting. And they was having them like that. New Bethlehem Missionary Baptist Church, and then also over at uh, Greater St. John, Great Great Something St. John AME Church, and also at uh, St. Paul or either First Baptist. And that's when they started having the meetings. And so when he went down there and got arrested, then of course, uh, Bishop Black and myself, we were classmates, and Elton was four grades ahead of us, and we was. We were the little kind of leaders that we kind of met within the school at Nichols 
the word was buzzing around at its students. Mm -hmm. And so we was kind of the leaders of the groups. And so what we decided that we put our head together and said, well, we're going to go, go down and see if Dr. Mason would meet with us and encourage him to try to reorganize, go back down there for the way he So he got bailed out and he was just there in yeah. his office that you went to see him? Yeah, he was at his office. And that and what we did, we said, well, we were going to meet right after we got out. You know, school was out. And the three of us walked down and out uh, you know, to down Dixon Street, down to where his office was at, which was on the corner of Dixon and the division at the time. And we asked the receptionist if we could set up an apartment and come see him right there. Honored that apartment and came in, and that's what we recommended to him that he organize and okay. go, back to, go back on the beach. So from that meeting, next thing I knew, the announcement was that uh, we were going to have another rally at the VA Hall, that's the United Benevolent Association, which was right there where Beck Park is on the, it was actually where the, where the greatest St. John and the church was, uh -huh. it was over to the left. Right, 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 right. right. Yep. Okay. And, uh, and of course, that was right. meeting. That was front street from where you live, right, right, right there. Right. No, because I was on the vision and, uh, Elma Street. Oh, okay. And then right next to that was that you like they had the first black USO. Oh, okay. And that's a lot of yeah. Yep. And then we had like the rec, the rec center and that recreation city was a recreation department with like little pool tables and ping pong table. So I was one of the champions up in there. Okay. Playing pool and ten, you know, ping pong. And then uh, next to it was uh, the Back Bay Mission with the Chambers. Uh, and then next to it was the uh, St. John and the MB Church. And then over there was the UV Hall. Okay. Had a house next to that, and then was back then. That's kind of the lay of the land. So when next thing I knew that, you know, I heard my, my grandmother and my mother were saying we were going to have a meeting. The meeting was held in, at night because the, the people were working and they couldn't go to their meetings during the day. So they didn't have it at babysitting service. So my wife and I, my, my sister and I, we was going, we was taken to the meeting. Okay. So that's when I went to the meeting at, at the UBA Hall that night. That's when uh, I got a chance to see Dr. Mason adequately speak. Do you remember like how many people were there? Were like a little bit? Quite a few. Okay. Because people were was upset yeah, yeah. about them arresting him. Yeah. And, okay. And, the, and him being denied the right to go on the beach, mm -hmm. people were upset about that anyway. And so um, it was quite a few people in there. But say it had like a previous rally, just like it maybe in New Bath, and then they might have had one in Purdue. Baptist missionary, but this major meeting was just before the way in that Sunday. Uh, so when he was up there, he started teaching the Mahatma Gandhi uh, nonviolent techniques, and he could recite the amendments for freedom day from memory, and that's what that's what made a big impression on me. And he could uh, cite the Constitution word for word. And uh, so while he was talking, he was saying that we were going to organize and we were going to go back down there that Sunday, which was going to be Easter Sunday. He had gone on the 17th and got arrested. And that was the 24th of April, 1960. And he said that uh, anybody that wanted to go, we were going to meet at Bank Down today in his funeral home at the church service, uh, which was going to be about two o'clock that Sunday. Mm -hmm. So my family and I, when we went back, then we decided, you know, I don't really want to go and do that all that time. So we decided we were all going to participate. And uh, so I had. 
had a little job, and I had bought me a brand new couch and watch. And my little beach slipper was brand new. I went and bought those. I bought this uh, brand new T-shirt, some shorts. I'm getting dressed up to go on the beach. <laughs> I know it was going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so you're thinking more excited about being on the beach, not realizing yeah, that you're ready to go. You know, walk, walk, walk. I've been denied this opportunity all these yeah, years. Yeah. <laughs> T-shirt and short pants and brand new Elgin watch. <laughs> it made that money, you know. But anyway, uh, that's what I had to go down there. And uh, we went on to church and came back home and then uh, my family and I, we decided to go ride and uh, I was with my stepfather at the time, he got there on the phone too. And uh, he was going to drive and then uh, we went down and some people walked, some people rode bicycles, people rode in the car. So, but anyway, uh, we uh, met at McDaniel's funeral home. And uh, when we got there, then uh, Dr. Mason, it would be everybody come in and they called everybody in so we could assemble. And he asked, did anybody have any weapons? And that was a lady in there that had a finger in the bottom. And she asked him, say, what about, I have a finger in the bottom, is that all right? He said, no, give it to me. So he took the finger in the bottom. And uh, he asked, would anybody else, nobody else said anything. So <clears throat> from that, he said, we were going to disperse and go ahead on down to the beach. So we, you know, got in our car and we drove down Belma Street. And he stepped off the park right by the <clears throat> Church of Redeemer at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let me out because the group right there by the small crab harbor was the two of us that was in Mike, we were Mike Ray. And, uh, and then you had some mostly women, and you had a, the, like the leader of the group in that section was Mr. McDaniels and his wife. Okay. Well, uh, and the reason, well, he was a pill home. Oh, right. Okay. And then, uh, but my father drove the car down to the lighthouse section, and that's where my sister got out. She was in the same class. She and Elton ran a class with a classmate and uh, dropped her off there. That's where that group was, and the leader of that group was Mr. Dr. Galloway. Mm -hmm. He also owned a mm -hmm. funeral. And then you had women, most of the women, and just very few men. And then my stepfather and my mother got out in the section by the cemetery, in front of the cemetery on Highway 9. And that's where the adults were. The leader of that group was Mr. Marvin Dickey, and he also owned it. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. yeah. Okay. Because any of the other men was caught down in them, then they would lose the job. Yeah. So most of them were that yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, and so we were in those three groups. And of course, you know, I didn't know exactly what was happening in the other groups until the aftermath. And I can go back and bring that up for you once you mm -hmm. took me in. <laughs> so you want me to tell you about what happened in my section? Yeah, uh, yeah, please, yeah. Okay. Went on down, and of course, I took my tie off and Folded it up real neat, laid it on the beach, and I took my elder watch and put it into the pocket so it would be protected, you know. About, about how many people were there with you, you remember? That's a, that's a hard question. But okay. But really, I was, I, was, I had my witnesses on. Yeah. Um, Gary Rainey, that was a brother, mm -hmm. last night, one of our brothers. And uh, we was going to go swimming. The rest of them had like the little softball man, the softball, they had the football. The ladies had picked like the 
picnic baskets with the food and all and they had the blankets you know, same. So that's what they basically were doing. And yes, you're talking about because it was a total of 125 people. So maybe I guess in our group might have been maybe 35. Okay. And I'm just okay. Yep. Yep. Don't quote me on yep. that though. <laughs> anyway, I'm uh, Gary and I, we out by the water the edge. Everybody else is up there in the same yeah. playing football. Yeah, you were eager getting that water. <laughs> Water. So we left that by the water. And then as you look, out there you see that little boat up there. Yeah. Yeah. That was a Gary's father. That, that was Rainey's father. Okay. Jane Rainey, Junior's father. But anyway, he was in that boat, and my uncle Nolan Max Wayne Senior was in the boat. And uh, while Gary and I was in the water, you know, we just Going in there trying. We, we thought we could go in there and just jump in the water and swim. But the water was so shallow. We had to walk out there about right, 50 miles. Right, still that way. Before, before it started getting a little deep. You yeah. Know? Yeah. We said, gee, we just. <laughs> and all this water looked like it was deep. <laughs> and then, uh, so we got there and then when, uh, that's what I tell folks, I say to him, Anyway, we're going to jump on the head, go under the water, go see if I see some fish or something. Get up under there, and you can't see anything because the water was what? Well, it, I mean, our Gulf water here is, is not crystal clear, right? It, it has what in it? Well, it burned your eyes. Oh, well, oh, it was burning it, your it, eyes. The salt it water. It was salt water. Yeah, so. <laughs> So, so that was for you the first time of swimming in the ocean, right? So that 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 day was it your first time to be, you know, down in the ocean, right? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay, it was. Yeah. Cause, cause I, and I jumped up under there and couldn't see anything. Yeah, and my eyes were burning. <laughs> yeah, folks, I was out there in 1960, but I ain't been back there no. I ain't been back this bit. <laughs> Tracy found out where I was hanging out over at the pool. Yeah, you know the water it was clear, and all that you could learn how to swim. But anyway, we were still right. You know, we still by the water. We might get putting our eyes up under there, but we still, you know, staying cool with the sun out there. And uh, Mr. Rainey pulled the boat up, and my uncle got out the boat with us. With us. And so we were standing there uh, and talking to him and Mr. Rain. And Mr. Rain said, well, he's going to go back and patrol the rest of the areas. And that's what I found out, that he was actually patrolling between the three groups. And uh, in that channel back there between, uh, I think it's Deer Island. Right, right. And behind the boat, you know, or in the Hard Rock, that little channel. Then that's what he was and seeing how everything went. Then found out later on that Dr. Gibbard on Mesa Senior was in his his blue Buick patrolling Highway 9 between the three groups to see how everything was going. Mm -hmm. So that's how we are organized, mm -hmm. which I didn't know. I was 14, I didn't learn about that. <laughs> but later on I did find out. Yeah. But that's what he was doing. So we just out there in the water and just standing up there, you know, you can stand on the sand, see everybody else over there playing and everything. And uh, so, what happened was, I'm just going to take you forward just a second when we, when everything was, when all the bottles of attacks and all that was over, then we got back to the house. Then that's when my sister told me that uh, they was down by the lighthouse section. She had never been all of them. She told me from where they were standing, they could see across the highway. It was the Biloxi Hotel. That's over there with that kind of name. You know, kind of. But right there, they could see the police, the local police and the state police organizing this all white mall. And it was, I think they were either 18 or 19 and up, number men. And they had like tie in, tie in. Grass knuckles, 
just whatever come down and beat you and and uh and we about that we didn't have anything not about protest and uh so that they ended up going and attacking the people over in front of the cemetery first mm-hmm. once they attacked them then they came to the lighthouse section and so then they ended up coming to us last uh, but where we were right by the small craft harbor you go to that little walk out to see mm-hmm. exactly where we were on the beach. But right across the street from that location, guess what was over there across the street? Um, well, hospital. Oh, okay, that's right. Yep. That's where that being the being a location was. That's right, yep. Okay. And uh so but anyway, while we stand in there right there by the little show line because what happened is Mr. Rainey had left, he'd gone back patrolling, you know. And Gary and I was standing right there by the sand right there looking at him play softball or football. And then I could see like in the little bays up there, the parking bays, you can see a car pull up and you see maybe two guys, two white guys get out and just kind of talk, you know. You look around, you say, well, you don't think anything of that, you know. Then after a while, another car pulled up. There were two or three more getting out. They were standing up. And so we kind of just went back and just dipped in the water a little bit. And then when I came back and turned around and looked up there, the whole little mob had assembled and they yeah. started heading yeah. down to yeah. where we were. Yeah. And we was like, right here. And they kind of came down, like right over here. And while they was over here, Mr. McDaniels and and uh, they were playing softball. So he had a like a little softball bat that he had in his hand. And uh, so what happened? He saw the mob. He kind of just turned around, and the leader of the group was Mr. Later on, I found out that he was Mr. Benin. He, he was, was the leader of the white group. Of the white group, okay. and he actually owned. Uh, the Ravine's grocery store right down Nixon. Is there right in your neighborhood? Right across wow. Dr. Mason Walker. Okay, wow. But he was, I just knew that he was, he was a real, like I knew it, like I'm, I'm real big. Yeah. He was a real big white man. He was real tall. And Mr. McDaniel was about five something. He was real sharp. And Mr. McDaniel was standing there and he had the bat to the side, on the side of it. And, and that gentleman said, all right, let's go. And when he said that, Mr. McDaniel was asking, he was getting ready to ask him what he was saying. And before he can answer him, he reached out there and grabbed that bat out of Mr. McDaniel's hand and started hitting him upside the head. And then the rest of them started attacking. And they, I mean, they knew each other, right? I mean, I mean, it's like they, I mean, I'm sure that they. Well, Mr. McDaniel's been home right there. Right. To right. 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 <laughs> no, they yeah, no, of course. He, yeah. he owned the, the Levine yeah. grocery store. Yeah. So I didn't know him. All I just know he was a big white man. I right. knew he was real right. tall, Mr. McDaniel's mom. But then they was they was over here, they started fighting over here. And I messed around and looked around. I looked around. Gary, my classmate, ain't said a word to me. He about halfway up. He went. And I said, I said, look at God. I said, the prayer of God. I said, that's my only way out. I can't go that way because that's where they're attacking, you know. So I started running around this way. And as I was running this way before I got to the seawall, I could hear a voice over here saying, you better catch that nigga. You better not catch that in. You better not let him get away. And when I looked around, this, model, this white guy was about 19 years old. Running, running after me. I'm 14 now. So what happened is when the attack started, all that traffic on Highway 90 had jammed yeah. and come to a stop. Yeah. And I said to myself, I said, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run across this highway and I'm going to go back in that mansion and I'm going on back down to the hood. That, that neighborhood, you know. <laughs> and so I'm running. So I 
run between those calls and everything kind of stopped. And then I got through that. I got into that that big yard and mansion was there. And as I'm running, he running behind me, coming out. Of me. So when I run, and I, I said, "Well, I'm gonna go to the side over here and go on through the backyard and go ahead on down home, you know, to the hood." So when I got around and I looked back there, it was a fence ten foot tall. Yeah, I knew I couldn't yeah. scale there. Yeah. So, you know, this is a this is a non-violent protest, right? So I said to myself, I said to God, I said a prayer, and I turned around and I bought my fist. I turned around, that guy was running after me, and as he ran and got close to me, I just swung real hard at his chin. Okay. And when I okay. swung so hard, it made me fall down over to the east. <laughs> He was, he ducked back and he ducked back so hard that he fell over to the west. When we got up, he went west <laughs> and I went east. <laughs> and I say, I say, you know, <laughs> it's amazing how God protects you. Yeah. But even when, when I got up and I went east, I was right there going right there by the Church of Redeemer. Uh -huh. And right there, the street right there next to him is Bell. Yes, it was already sitting there when I got there. My mother, my sister, no, their father, their father was there waiting on them. See, now they couldn't be nothing but God. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they come down from the other part. Of yeah, because okay. yeah, he already they, they got beat up down off yeah, of the, yeah. by the cemetery, and then they come down to the lighthouse. They got us this place, yeah. and then they came on and just put a park right there. Yeah. And so I just went on and got in the car yeah. and we drove on back over to the division and got at 206, it was the 206 East Division at the time. And we had a front porch on, on the front of the house. So when we walked in the front porch, guess what hit me? Oh, yeah, you left all your stuff on the table. Yeah. <laughs> that brand that new watch, watch. That brand new LG watch. Oh no. <laughs> In my brand new clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I told my stepfather, I say, uh, say, Dad, in my, uh, I left my brand new Elgin watch and my brand new short pants and my clothes on the beat. And my nickname at Biloxi was Bootsy. People, the people, the students knew Bootsy, they didn't know Clement Jemison in school. Everybody had a nickname, see. But anyway, he said, Boots said, well, we'll go back down there and get it. We'll ride down there and get it. My mother and my sister had more sense than we did. So we got in the car, and he and I, we drove back down there. We parked right there at the same location on Belmont. By that time, we got down there. All the white folks was uh, gathering in that area. They just a lot of them. And we were walking down that sidewalk toward the front beach. And as we walking down the sidewalk, then uh, stepfather passed this real big uh, white man, and uh, this big Mac white man took his elbow and and elbowed him. And my stepfather said, "Excuse me, sir." And he said, "You better say excuse me, uh, Ian." And uh, at that juncture, my stepfather reached over to me. He said, "Bootsy." He said. You can get another watch, but you can't get another life. That's what he was telling me. And I understood exactly what he was saying. Yeah. And so at that juncture, we turned around and we went back to the car. But when we turned around and looked out there where my clothes were, my watch, you could see smoke coming up. So. I'm sure they probably took the watch out for the burn and stuff up. Yeah, yeah. And so well, we got in the car and came on back home. And uh, as I sit here today, I had all kinds of watches. And this right here is a national championship watch. And guess who went to this school? Tracy. Oh, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the basketball 06 national championship. University of Florida. Yeah. 
And then I got the nine, the 96 Steve Furrier, your Danny Walker watch at the house. I see. Okay. So, but I've had all kind of watches yep. since then. Yep. Yep. But, uh, so, so do you remember much about what happened like later that evening? I, I know there's a lot that went on in the, the next, that night. And next yeah, day. you told me I brought the, I put, brought the rifle that I showed you over at yeah. place. Okay, well, well why don't you talk a bit about what you remember that, that evening as well? If you, if you yeah, because what happened is, uh, my uncle, no one that claim seen him, but one of the committed people in, uh, the, the group that they had, they had a special name, you probably read it. But anyway, um, he came by and asked us if we have any, any guns in the house because he knew that it was going to be retaliation. And my grandmother told him, no, we didn't have any guns. So he went and got this uh, this twenty two rifle and brought it and told us to give us the the shells and everything, and told us we had that for our protection. So I actually had that, I still have that. He actually gave that rifle to me, and I had it still at the house. I started, I started to donate it to the two museum, but something told me not to do that. Because um, you know, you give it, and you don't know whether you're going to exhibit it or not, but you know, still had it. so. Maybe come up with something in the museum or something. I'll probably give it to one down here. Or either I can probably donate it up there later on. But, but I have that rifle. But that night is when uh, you could hear the gunshots. And you just uh, hear all probably screaming and yelling and all that. Nervous all night here and stuff. All during the night. So you, you know, it's a scary moment. Yeah. Real scary. <laughs> And then they have a, one of the stories is seeing uh, my cousin, uh, Bud, Bud Strong, uh, that they say that uh, was killed. He actually was supposed to be killed over in North of Luxe, and they slid his throat. So he was your cousin? Yeah, he was my cousin. Okay. Yeah, Bud, he, Bud was a, he was a whole, whole lot older yeah. man. Yeah. His, uh, his sister was my aunt, who was Corrine Strong, who was a sixth grade teacher in okay. Nickel. But she was real strict. And, uh, but anyway, Bud, but all, he was, you know, he was real old. He was a lot older than her, and he would just walk the street. He wouldn't bother anybody, you know, not even my plea. But anyway, what word is that evidently they must have took him picked him up while he was walking in Biloxi and took him over there in North Biloxi and slid his stroke and then took him and propped him up in front of the Jefferson Davis Shrine. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but that's supposed to have, have happened there. The other, the other thing uh, with uh, Malcolm Jackson, uh, Malcolm Jackson was in the same way with Ethel Randy Clay, and he had left here, but, and the, the, they were saying that he was, and I, I know when he come, when he came back, his, when he actually came back, the, the story is, is that he was killed during the same time. That was a different time period. Okay. Okay. So, because he came back a little bit later, he had gone out to California. Now, Malcolm Jackson, my cousin, he was light skinned but he was, Real muscular. And we had another, the Pleasant Reading House. And uh, my, my classmate was Wayne Stewart. She had, he had to pass away when he was about six or seven grade. He had spot him in a giant. And, uh, but anyway, his two cousins, Calvin and uh, Edward Stewart. Uh, was fighters. Elvis Stewart was a fighter. Mike Mack was a fighter. But anyway, uh, Mack had gone in the service and came back. And when he came back, it was that the, the police stopped him or something, and then they ended up taking him over there to pass him through the jail. And the kind of way they must have beat him up. Yeah. Where it is that they killed him in the jail. Yeah. 
they were saying that he was actually going to you know, kill them. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. So, um, well, first off, this has been just really, really wonderful to hear all the details. I'm going to ask you to talk well, about something else if you don't mind for a bit. Um, but, but before you do that, okay. maybe, yeah. maybe plug in a Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. I think the, the, that's significant. Uh, what happened was, of course, after the 60s weighed in, of course, the public, what was the public assets laws passed. Okay. And then also, that's when uh, the first NAACP was done. Black folk had an NAACP, Dr. Donald was by mm -hmm. the president of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what Dr. Mason was going up under originally and to get the attorneys and everything starting the case with the United States Birds of Paris and County. Mm -hmm. And they would go on to the Board of Supervisors meeting and go on, he was going to all the Greek uh, organization and community organization and speaking and bringing the community together on this issue. Anyway, I ended up um, leaving, graduating, and going to Jackson State to be the scholarship and ended up in the I was uh, my freshman year. They had a brand new dorm that they called Stewart, Stewart Hall. And I was in the dorm, and that was in 1965. And the dorm, and my dorm uh, person called me on the intercom and told me to come by the desk. And so I went by to see him. He told me that the register office called and told, said, you need to get over there real quick. I was, I was wondering, I said, I wonder if my grades are right or what? Oh, man. I'm going to find Phil because I'm, you know, I'm on a scholarship because I'm in the band and I got a scholarship in music. So I run on over there to the register office. I get there. When I get there, you know, I get getting ready to go in the door. These two white gentlemen in these suits ask me, say, are you Clement Jemison? I said, yeah. They say, and then they start telling me the story that I told you, everything that I had done on the beach. And I'm saying to myself, now how do you know all this? And uh so then what he did, they uh reached in his pocket and pulled out his bag. He was the FBI. Okay. They had come to subpoena me to come back and testify in the uh, Southern Peter District. Okay. Go, yeah. go to the post office uh -huh. in the Anson County versus the uh, uh, United States okay. and uh, their case. So they gave me a little stipend and a for them and bought my bus, bus ticket on Trailway. The Trailway was coming north and south yeah. and going, I was going east and west. And so I caught the bus and I was happy to get that little extra money, you know, I'm college student. So, so rode the bus, came down here. Got to the court house, they said, Well, they didn't get to me that time. So I got back on the bus, went back up there. Then they called me and they sent me another little stipend. So I was smiling again. Got me some money. Got me. Rode the bus on down there so I can go testify again. I said, Well, we couldn't get to you that time. So back in that third time, they called me. I went back down there and Got them to stand. And I'm still trying to get that, that transcript of what I okay. said. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but anyway, when it, and uh, and then I think I sent you that thing uh, with the, that had my name listed in there mm -hmm. with the other individual that testified. Yeah. Yeah. I found that on Google. Yeah. And uh, was able to testify. And then that's when we actually, that's when they actually started the first branch of the NWCP, Dr. Gilbert Mason became the president. And uh, Ethel Randy Flay was a senior. 
and, and she was the president and Bishop Black was vice president. So they elected me as the third vice president. Mm -hmm. They they wouldn't let me go. So <laughs> so and then of course Delta finished that year and she went up to college and then Bishop Black became the president and the vice president. I see. And so you ask when we actually the youth branch of the NLC, NLCP, actually that's what I'm gonna get get with Boko Gilly John also over there at the Woodward building on Mama Avenue. We the youth branch actually went in did a city in at Woodward. So that's when you'd already you're already up at Jackson State. You came back to town to do that or mm -hmm. I guess, I guess it might have been. Okay. Six now, because I finished in 64. Okay. I think that might have been a little bit tough. I see. Okay. Yeah. So that's what I, that's the point I went to Jack. I see. I got the so came up. That was one of our activities. We did a sitting and we went in to test to see if they were going to serve us or not. Okay. And that building is still over there. So then I know where it's located. Yeah. And uh, so anyway. What, what, what happened when you did that? Uh, we sit at the counter and the folks was coming in some people were harassing us you know making noises and all yeah. that and other people was commending us yeah mm -hmm. but we sit there for quite a while and then they did not serve us and so we were able to get you know get up and walk out and not be attacked i see just the bird attacks but you can withstand you know but anyway we did that and then what we did was uh, the youth branch. What they did was they brought in the uh, four and SNCC mm -hmm. to do the nonviolent training and the voter registration training. And we had that's when the NWCP office was right on Main Street. Miss mm -hmm. Myrtle Davis, Miss mm -hmm. Myrtle Davis. Home was there, and then her, her in a, sewing office, and, and then she had a, a sewing office right. next door, and so yeah. he um, let the NWCP use that office, okay. and that's where we was. That's where our training was with the youth branch on the voter registration and uh, tags. Okay, then what we did. Our next thing was once we was trained on voter registration and. The youth branch was the catalyst that actually did the voter registration. With under, you could under, you under, vote yet, you're helping people register. Well, we we were the the we was put out front with the supervision of yep. the adult members. Okay. So and I remember right there where the bus and door just stay right there with the little theater that was a voting precinct on Lee Street. So that's one of the first locations that we did the voter registration. We did it on that side because you can be on the yeah. property of the precinct. Mm -hmm. So, well, I, I know. I mean, one of the things that that I've always noted around that same time, and I, I didn't know you were a part of that. That that one of the important things that happened was, you know, the the election of new mayor, Mayor Guys, who yeah, who kind of for the first time saw right. saw you know East Block City yeah. community as being part of his yeah. kind of voters, right? Right. He's so so you're part of that effort to try to get right bring that change. He, about, he right? was a very positive change. Yep. For the blacks. And, yep. And uh and we love that guys. Yeah. Now, the other thing we did, I don't know if you have this, but anyway, the well actually it was Bishop Black, myself. And uh, we hold the Estes Jr. He uh, and Dr. Gabriel Mason. What happened is we were going to test and tested the public access laws. And what we did, the Greyhound bus station was right over there across from St. Paul Church. Okay. That little section right there, that's where the Greyhound bus station was. And when we went to the Greyhound bus station, and the blacks were there to buy a ticket. They could go in just the regular waiting room and go to the baggage section and buy your ticket. And then you had to stand outside and put it on the back. So our, our job, job was to go and test to see if we could go into the white waiting room mm -hmm. and sit at the counter. They had a lunch counter in there. Yeah. And, and that's what we did. We went and sit at the lunch counter. 
that was Richard Black, myself, and we all those of us with Jimmy Ben. We sit at the lunch counter and we got served without an incident. And then we went and bought our ticket in that great room. We had a nice, it was laid out flush. But like the bag section, going down to sweat and everything. And then we got our ticket and we went to sit in the seats. We still being an incident. Then we went out and fought the bus. The ticket was to New Orleans. Then we got on the bus. We stood right behind the bus stop. And we rode the ground bus to New Orleans. Dr. Gibbard our makes a senior trailer in his car. And when we got to the terminal, we got off put down yesterday and okay. we brought it back. Okay. But that needs to be recorded. Yeah. Okay. Now, I got that in my little book. Yeah. But if nobody don't find it, it might just be lost. And so the other thing, one of the other things we did was the Black Theater, Harlem. Did you ever hear about that? You know where Tyrone Barbershop is? Of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, where Tyrone Barbershop is. Yeah. Tyrone came in here from Franklin to Louisiana. He was, a, I guess, about 18 years old young man. And he was cutting my hair when I was in 10th and 11th grade. Well, the Harlem Theater, and I got a picture of it, because you know, I'm on the Harlem Authority. They had these pictures and they read it on the way, so I got them. Anyway, they had like the little ticket booth, you know, to the right. They had like a little, like a little room in section. So that's where Tyrone's first barbershop was here, right in that the right part of that hall of theater. And then happened this. The way, the way he got, he moved over to the other side of the street was, when we, the Harlem Theater had got in uh, the sanitary condition was poor, they weren't taking care of it. And so we, the youth branch, formed a protest to close it down. But the condition was horrible and uh, couldn't pick it right on the side where the theater was. So we was on the side right there by Mr. Merle Davis office and home mm -hmm. and we was picking them now the youth branch uh, while we were picking them the police came and they arrested bishop black and myself so we were we the oldest ones they released the others to so either their family or you just let them go but they arrested us they took us down there and put us in jail the jail was in the center of Main Street. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. No, there used to be the, yeah, the City Hall the jail was right there, right in the middle of the street. Kind of went around it. Right, on yep. both sides. Yep. Right. Yep. You go up that way, go right, and you come back the other way. Yep. But we was the jail was down in the in the cellar, and it was damp. Yeah. It was dark. It was just dreary. And when they put us in that jail. I would never go to jail again. <laughs> <laughs> so they put us in there, and then Dr. Mason came and bailed us out. Okay, right. Okay, yeah. And my uncle and different people mm -hmm. was having his bail. Okay. Okay. But anyway, he bailed us out, and then we had to go on the second floor where the credit court came in. We started to talk to so we went back to the courts and the judge ruled that we was uh we was laudable. Y'all can probably pronounce it better than I can, but anyway. Uh, a long time ago I, I found an article with that story in it. Mm -hmm. But guess where it came from? The Clarence Legend. Oh, okay. The they ever hit they even talk of that. But uh, yeah, so that's one of the things we did. Okay, okay. Well, um, we, we could we could like spend all day here. I, 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 you want to talk at all about the? One more thing, if you would. Um, but you know about the sun and sand, don't you? I do. 
Okay, but let me ask you one more question because I want to okay. jump, I want to jump you ahead. Okay. Um, I think a lot of our viewers, listeners may not realize this, and, but I think it's really important, and that is that you have, for many years, worked done a lot of work to get the names of all these people, right? Right. Right. And um, which is which is a, a kind of remarkable effort, and one that that I you know admire the, the kind of care. Can you just talk a bit about that? Kind of like yeah. why you decided to do that and kind of, yeah. you know, if you could talk a bit about that, that'd be great. Well, I'll mean, tell you what, where that came from. What happened is uh, we had the first, the big, the big rally. Uh, I don't know if you was here then. You might not have been here. I'm not sure. But we had our first big old rally out there. That's before they put that uh, first mark out there on the beach. Uh huh was at Jeff Davis Community College. Okay. You weren't here doing that time. Yeah. Okay, and what they did when they was out there with the big rally, they had me as a, a guest speaker, they had Bishop Black, they had Leroy County, and they had us up on the stage as the key people. Um, okay, right up to the way. Uh, and what happened is when they had the big rally, then that's when it actually hit to me that you know we got the big rally, but you know you we got you know you got the markers and everything that's bearing Dr. Gilbert Mason name, and then you know we and everything like that. I say, but you know it took the citizen yeah. risk their lives, right? And families was down there on that beach. And uh it came to me, so I shared that with Black, Bishop Black and Devo County, and told them we need to go ahead and try to get a list of names and come together and put that together. Bishop Black said he didn't have time to do that. He was so he wasn't interested. And that just something that God put on my heart. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was necessary, but I think the most important thing, David, is what I found in my life. God has put me in places mm -hmm. and has brought me through things that, that you never could think about. It's only through the grace of God I'm sitting here talking to you right now. Because I'm survived, I survived four different cancers. And each time he has brought me through and he's keeping me here for a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. And he put me in a position by being. Even when I went to the Alumni Association, they tried to get me to be president. And uh, my wife told me, I think I told you, but my wife told me, say, if you take another position, you're going to have to move out in the garage. <laughs> and great, I'm telling David, David came and saw my garage. <laughs> So I did not take that position. <laughs> well, I didn't take the position, Dave, because I ain't got no room. Yeah, if she'd yeah. put me out, I'd have been out in the cold. It's kind of a shaky garage. <laughs> so, but anyway, with me being in that position, and with, uh, I mentioned about Vernon Jackson, mm -hmm. and what Vernon Jackson did, he wrote, he the one who wrote the history for the, the Luna Association. He did the Nichols. And Mrs. Uh, Rowan, Larry Rowan, that did the ordinance. Mm -hmm. And those histories in that book. But Vernon Jackson, he, Vernon Jackson was in the class with my sister, which was four years, four grades ahead of me, but he was the youngest one in the class. I think he was about 15 in a senior in high school. Okay. But he, he had gone gone in the army, he had gone to Germany, and when he came back, he was working with the post office. So I guess with the post office, he already had a photo standing mirror. Now, what I what I did when I sum it up with my music, uh, the band director showed me to play drums uh, with the adults in the club. At 14 years old, my classmates didn't know mm -hmm. that when I got out of school, when I got out of school, the band director would come in, pick me up at maybe seven o'clock at night. I'd move my drums in his car, 
in the car we're driving in. We might go to Vietnam and Pat can go to we might be second avenue or the first club. We play at the two or three o'clock in the morning. And then when I come home, I gotta get up at seven thirty to be up the nickels. Yeah. At least to know yeah. I was doing that. Yeah. But uh, Anyway, like I say, you put put you in a different position. Wow. So what I did was I I started the nickel swing bands that I was duplicated with my band of record deal with the outside band. And Vernon Jackson was my lead vocalist. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Bishop Black played from though. Okay. In the swing band. And then I, I don't know if you know Robert Waters used to be on the state. Uh, College board okay. of education. Okay, well, he played trumpet. Okay, and we had another uh, boy, Freedale, he had three trumpets. Yeah, then another boy, George Ross, played baritone horn, so that was the bass. And later on, he picked up the bass guitar. But I put the I put the swing band together, and Vernon was our lead vocalist. And uh, what I did was, uh I found out that the team, but because I was playing with uh, MC Spencer and his band, we were playing at the Almond Club, we were playing at the Officer Club, and also the NCO Club. And I found out they had the team center out there. So what I did, I would go and book the job. I booked the job at the team center on Friday so I can pay them off and get the paycheck. And then I went over to Gulf Hills. Gulf Hills was restricted to black. But I went over there and booked the job with the Nicholas Wayne band at South East. I see. Now, the last job we got that I booked was at the Bo Weaver Club. You know where that was? I don't know where it was. No. Where was that? See, so you probably know. That was up in Social Mississippi. I know. I don't know. Okay. So we went to the Bo Weaver Club to go play. Ain't never, ain't know nothing about no social. So we go in there, it's about six or seven o'clock in the evening, you know. Go in there and I sit in the drum side. He let me get to start playing with nobody in there. And the while people start coming in. And when the guys coming in there, they start calling us all kind of names and start kind of attacking. And uh the, we had to get out, I grabbed my drum and we got our stuff, we got out of it. Yeah. We had to worry about going to Bo Reba yeah. Club. That's <laughs> true. So it sounds like so you've been close to Vernon Jackson for a long time as well. You know, one of these yeah, things. so then what Vernon would do, Vernon, when he came home, he got a, he was a post, he was a post now. Yeah. And I guess with his, his being 15, he had to be sharp like Martin Luther King. So he had a full static memory. Okay. And so I would I would use that resource because he would go in every day, he would go visit the cemetery. Oh, okay. And if anybody died and you didn't know where they were, you asked Vernon. Okay. He could be at his house, he'll call you on the phone, he'll direct you to the grave. Okay. Well, That's how precise you Well, so, I don't know, I don't know about uh, you know and so what, Vernon, but I know that you have an amazing memory. Okay. It may not be. It may not be. Uh, we know we. we <laughs> our, 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 we, we, we kind of combine our memories together. Yeah. Because he was good in one ear and I was good in the other. Yeah. So, what happened was, like I say, Vernon had that photostatic memory. So, like, like when I got ready to find out who had died. Mm -hmm. Then Vernon could supply that to me. Okay. He's deceased now. So yep. that, that's a okay. lost art, but it gave me a chance to get okay. uh, gave me a chance to get the weight in this mm -hmm. together. Now, thinking that Vernon was on the beach. Vernon mm -hmm. said no, his mother and when he let allow him out of the house, yeah. he heard about going down there on the beach. He wasn't even down there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh but anyway, by me being in the position of Vice President with the combined school in Georgia. Right, right. And we had addresses and phone numbers and yep. everything. So that allowed me to call because I didn't know who all was out there. I knew my family was out there and I knew I knew a lot of the different families was out there, but it was limited. 
So what I did, I took it on myself. I had everybody address around the, the world. And I called each one of them and asked them if they was on the beach. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got that list. Mm -hmm. And if they said they was on the beach, I did not question. Mm -hmm. And if they said they was out there and they would they brought somebody down there and they just out there, mm -hmm. I think that that's valid enough, but they could have been attacked too. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but you know, you I know you'll give a day so was coming on and yeah. people was coming on about who was down there, who was not. Yeah. But God then put them in a position that they put me in yeah. where I had that information where I could call people and yeah. every person and before they died, they could tell me if they were down there or they not. And then we, you know, we opened it up. Once I had the list, then we opened it up that when the people came, they could look, and if anybody's name was on there, then they could call me back uh, and say that so and so was on there, and I'll make sure they got on the list. It, it took a lot of time. Oh, it was like, oh, I, I, I'm sure it did. And, uh, yep. and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a they, they think yeah. I'm an easy going person, but I'll raise up in the hood. And I, I am pretty easy. But, but you're like, also, but very, you're also but, very persistent. <laughs> but, but see, and, and the thing about it is, even like my classmate, Bishop Black, we just like this. But Big, uh, Bishop Black told me, he said, he, like when he get up and he talk now, he said, well, we just spent too much time on the way and we don't need to be going back. But I know if the person doesn't know his history, he's not repeat it. Mm -hmm. And you're doomed to repeat it. And I understand Bishop Black is on a mission of economic development. But I'm on, I'm trying to preserve the history for the people. Yeah. The sacrifice. Mm -hmm. He was one of the ones that said Well, we um we have that's had a wonderful conversation here. and I can just add one thing as we wrap up for those that are going to watch this um, because of this remarkable work you know not only that we talked about in terms of the history of self but the remarkable work that Clement has done to create this list um, you know it gives us you know really um, this this extraordinary you know kind of opportunity to be able to establish a public memorial for all of those participants and it's a list of 170 something 177 names or something like that, that yeah that's why if you notice each time i would bring that up in the different meetings yep and then uh just through the grace of god when uh, the national parks came to the visitor center yep. i don't know what i was doing but i didn't know about it at the at the right time but when i found out i got down there and just I was in there, and that's when uh, they got up and put the asking. They were asking for the public input, and that's been a pet, pet peeve of mine all the time. And uh, I think we need to recognize those people that sacrifice their lives. They, the people are not really looking for the recognition, but they sacrifice their lives. They were down there, and it, it took it took the people, it took the whole community. In order to make the law change, mm -hmm. uh, of course, we had the best leader in the world, God sent him here, yeah. just like Moses. And, uh, and if I can tell you some stories that Dr. Gilbert R. Mason, senior, I don't know if I told you about the Field Mount trip. He did, and uh, 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 it's in the book, yep. 1962. Yep. But you know, he uh, he was scoutmaster, and he opened it up to all our our troops that he was going to be taking this trip to Field Mount. Field Mount is the big, the second biggest scouting event in the nation, in the world. And he said, if anybody want to go, pay your fee, then you can go. So I was one of those people that paid my fees, and you see it in the book. He he had our troop, and then. He connected with the scout master and Pastor Google, which I didn't know nothing about that. And the scout master and Pastor Google had his troop. This at a time when we going out to Cimarron, New Mexico, 
you and you can't stay at a hotel. And we had uh, my grandmother and my mother gave us them big old pack lunches that we had traveled with in the car. But I have to give it on Mason again. It's a learning experience. He had already made arrangements that when we left here and drove to Marshall, Texas, he had accommodation for us at Wiley Thomas. They put us up at night, they fed us, got up in the morning, had a good little shower, and they fed us breakfast. And then they, and we drove a long way, stopped on the road, and had our little sandwiches, and then we got down to El Paso. And I never forget that that, that El Paso put an impression on me, I never forget. It was so clean. And he had already made a arrangement at Texas Christian University. That's where we stayed on that beautiful campus. They fed us, put us up, and they gave us breakfast, and then we went back on our way. We got up to, you ever heard of Claude Black, Claude Black Cave? Mm -hmm. Claude Black Cabin. Yeah. On our way, we stopped at Claude Black Cabin. Okay. We got out of the car and we went in the cave during the day. Guess what we saw? When we got in the cave, what was in the cave? Uh, I, I've been there, but I, <laughs> you, I, I think we passed did, in cave. But did you go in there? I did you go in the cave? I've been there. Yeah, yeah. You probably passed by. You probably didn't go in the cave. But when you went in that cave, millions of bats up there sleep yeah. yeah. on the ceiling. That one impression, I tell you. And so then we left and went on to Simmerman. Got to Simmerman, we had this, they assigned a tour guide. And, and this was the white guy that you see sitting in my picture in the feature Blood and Valley when they got to film my picture. He was our tour guide. And then they assigned a borough to us. Mm -hmm. Okay, what was the borough for? They meant to carry your stuff. Oh, he's pretty sharp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the uh, tent. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, utensils yeah. and heavy equipment. And what happened is, when we first got there, you got all the scouts from all over the United States, and we had a powwow. Big old one. Really nice. And so what happened is, uh, then, after that, then we were assigned to our tour guide. And what they did was, we we had a, a certain trail that we we're going to be taking for maybe a week or two weeks, because that was doing that, that, that trip was for the, mm -hmm. for the summer. Like. So, for two, a week or two weeks, you get this tour guide. And what we're doing is, we're going from one campsite. To the other campsite. Some of the campsites was already had the housing and the bunk beds and all that. The other campsite was where you had to ditch every train there, take a shower out in the cold, outdoor showers, and and you go on and, and you might each day you might have to each time that you go on you gotta leave that site. Then you might be going five miles, you got to walk five miles, then you're going up mountains. Right, right. And, over mountains. Yep. and so we did that for the whole summer. And summer then the the you know how boys are right. They had these chipmunks out there. They out there chasing them, trying to get chipmunks. So when we get ready to go, they caught about two or three of them. And so when we get ready to come back, they got them in the car. And we come <laughs> we coming on back. We bring the chipmunk. We bring the chipmunk to Biloxi. <laughs> why? Why this? Why this? Now, when you look at that picture, us and Phil Mount, yeah. like you see me standing in the center, and over to the left, you see a light skinned boy standing up. He was in the Pascagoula tree, not knowing. That my wife, I married, Alma, was from Mars Park, 
when she told me about passing the good one. That was her, that was her cousin. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he was a twin. Well, I did joke. Okay. And he and I was friends. We became good friends. I say that. Okay. But anyway, we left there and we driving on back down. And when we get to Carl's back cabins, it's getting dust and we stop. This time we don't go in the cave. Yeah, it's probably saw the last time. Yeah. <laughs> oh, are you pretty sure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Millions of millions of bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, no, I'm sure that would be. I could see that right really, now. Yeah, probably really, really amazing. Yeah. And then when we get down to El Paso, guess where we go? Walk into Juarez. The way Juarez is, old Mexico. Oh, okay, sure. Right like across the, the yeah, right the Boa River, right, right, right. Yeah. 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 So that's what type of uh, give it on Mason. Yeah, and no, no, he's exposed us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we should probably wrap this up. <laughs> um, yeah, Tracy might want to shoot me. <laughs> no, 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 no. This, this is this is going to be wonderful, and I'm so glad that we, you know. Have it, uh, you know, for people to watch and share. Yeah. And, and so with that, I just want to thank you so much for not just not thank just for this much. wonderful time together, but but thank you for everything you've done. Um, you are okay. you are just you know su such a and and you're right. God God has put you in the right places, but also kept you around to be able to help others. So thank you. You're you're in the well, bed. You know you know David that kind of thing. But I tell but I tell folks I say. Uh, like I told you about that little couple that picked me up. Yeah. And you know, I tried to offer them some money or something. They said, oh no. And uh so you know from that I kind of just take things to fall I don't question yeah. people yeah. that need or anything. But from that I was on the I was on the music circuit at an early age. Okay, my grandmother and my mother allowed me to do that. Even in a, I think my junior year, that's what, the 1963, mm -hmm. the wild one on the beach. My band director, we was playing out there at Keith's uh, and he ran into the, not the Cal Callaway show, but the Cal White show. Cal White had like, they did like little tap dances and they had the little dances that they do. So he and my band director, Malachi Spencer, teamed up. And so we had a band and a show. And we left here and went out to home base with Amarillo, Texas. We we did it. We went and played in Louisiana. I did a, uh, a show there. And Cal, 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 Cal White would do the tap dancing. And then we went to Amarillo. And we had these rooming houses, which was on the music circuit. Uh, that we stayed in in our home base with Amarillo. So we go out from Amarillo, we go to Midland, Texas, and play, come back. We go to Fort Worth and come back. And my my mother gave me a money order with a certain amount of money. She said, "Now you tuck this away." She said, "Once you're out there on the road and things don't start going right," she said, "Use this for you." That's your pay at home. And that's what I did. So we, we played, like I said, Fort Worth, Midland, Texas, Longview, Texas, you know. And then we left there and we moved up to Oklahoma City. And I was impressed with Oklahoma City to see those, all those all way up in the city and making that all. But anyway, we would leave. Oklahoma City, and we go to Lawton, Oklahoma, which was a BMW. And I ran into all the personnel down here, and I mentioned that. They said, Yeah, I used to go to that club. But we went to Lawton, Oklahoma, we play, you come back, and then we go to Hobbs, New Mexico, and play in the club, and then close in Mexico. So this is the experience of that uh, early yeah. age. Yeah. I'm, still, I'm still in high school. Yeah. yeah. A junior in high school, so that's how I missed 63. Yep. Yep. And so we, we got Oklahoma, 
and they had a job in Tulsa. I got sick, had a real bad cold, so they couldn't. So they got another side man to go. So I missed that trip. I really wanted to go to Tulsa. But um, after we did that, then things started kind of going sour. So I took that money out of the trail. Uh, okay, came back. Yeah, yeah. came back. 